Hello and welcome to week 3 of the NPTEL MOOC course on uh, economics of health and education. In the last uh, lesson, we discussed the Grossman's demand for health model. As a part of this model, the highlight was on three uh, important uh, functions. One was the production function, where uh, the discussion was about Grossman uh, allotting health as a durable stock of capital good. And we discussed about how health in time period T plus 1 is dependent upon the stock of health in time T uh, plus the investments uh, made on it with respect to the expenditures made on the stock of health uh, minus the depreciation. We also discussed uh, a static utility function in a given time period T where utility is dependent upon uh, consumption of health goods or uh, health inducing goods and all other consumption goods. We also discussed the extended utility function which uh, took into account the life cycle approach to understanding uh, health utility. It was also referred to as an intertemporal utility function where along with uh, regarding uh, health as a uh, utility as a function of both uh, consumption goods and all and health goods, we also took into consideration the risk averseness of the individual which determines the curvature of the utility function and the discounted uh, value of health in a given point of time. Uh, we also discussed three functions of health in Grossman's model, where Grossman looked at health not just as a consumption good, but as a but also as a capital good, and as well as an input in production process which generates productive time. In this lesson, we will discuss a few more uh, aspects about on uh, demand uh, for health. Uh, so, in today's class, we will uh, again uh, summarize some of the key points of the Grossman's model because Grossman's model of demand for health has been used extensively in the economics of health and uh, there are various extensions to the uh, basic Grossman model that has taken place and uh, this will be one of the uh, important uh, points of reference to some of the discussions that we have in the later classes as well. So, it is important that we look at some of the implications of the Grossman's model. Uh, in today's class, we will also spend some time about the shape of the healthcare demand curve. Although discussions on the shape of the healthcare demand curve should have preceded the Grossman's model, however, I think for the uninitiated, it will make much sense now to be able to discuss whether the healthcare uh, demand curve is a downward sloping demand curve or not, and what are the considerations that go behind understanding the shape of the healthcare demand curve. Uh, in this class, I also want to introduce uh, two large scale experiments that have been carried out uh, and that has figured uh, repeatedly, frequently in various health economics textbooks, uh, the RAND Corporation's health insurance experiment and the Oregon Medicaid experiment. Uh, in today's class, I will refer to only those portions of this experiment which helps us to determine what is the shape of the demand curve or uh, what uh, others have studied about uh, what these studies have contributed in terms of uh, determining the shape of the healthcare demand curve. And then finally, we will end this lesson uh, with a justification uh, as to why uh, economic analysis is warranted for healthcare demand or understanding healthcare demand. So, let us begin with some of the key points from uh, Grossman's model. Um, we discussed health is a capital good. So, Grossman theorizes that health can be considered as a durable capital good and uh, as, as much as that it is a durable capital good, individuals invest in their health similar to how they invest in physical capital with the goal of improving or maintaining their health over time. The fact that health is uh, theorized as a capital good immediately places it in the domain of further analysis as to how investments in health. Uh, can lead to uh, various kinds of outcomes at the macro level as well as at the micro level. Health as a capital good uh, leads to increases in productivity at the individual level and uh, uh, health as a capital good also leads to increases in productivity at the macroeconomic level. Second is the uh, health the production function. Grossman introduces the idea of a health production function which describes how individuals produce health using a variety of inputs ranging from medical care, diet, exercise and other health related behaviors. And this function allows for the calculations of the efficiency and returns on uh, different uh, health investments and this is 
uh, one of the uh, important points that we are concerned uh, when we study uh, health production functions or when we try to come up with estimate health production functions based upon empirical studies. So, for example, in the area of health economics, you will see various studies at the all India level or at the state level where uh, researchers have worked on come up with health production functions uh, which gives us a sense of what are the different variables that goes into producing health at uh, some level of aggregation. Similarly, uh, this is the model which introduces dual role of health where health uh, directly generates utility as a consumption good which means that you know as uh, the stock of health deteriorates the demand for health increases and therefore investments in health also increases or the expenditure that we made on health goods increases. There is also an indirect uh, uh, measure that is brought about by uh, health because when you are increasing uh, consumption of health or when you are increasing expenditures made on health it is also increasing the time available available for labor and leisure which in turn affects income and consumption in the future period. So, in that sense it is also an investment good. So, Grossman's model brings to the fore the idea of health as both a consumption good as an and as well as an investment good. Uh, this model also talks about utility maximization. So, individuals are seen as rational agents who maximize the utility function and that depends on their health and consumption over their lifespan. So, they make decisions on health investments and consumption to maximize their overall lifetime utility taking into account the costs of health inputs and the budget constraints that they face. Theorizing uh, utility maximization over a period of uh, time uh, introduces the concept of dynamic optimization in the context of healthcare economics and this has been widely used by various economists post uh, the uh, discussion of Grossman's model. Another key point about Grossman's model is that when we talk about demand for health care, we must understand the demand for medical services is understood as a derived demand because health care demand is derived from the demand for health. The individual places a demand for good health or well-being and in so doing because the durable stock of capital uh, good uh, deteriorates over time, there is a demand for health care because there is a demand for health. So, as a person's health capital depreciates due to aging and other factors, they make health investments to maintain or improve their health stock and this is what is referred to as medical services as derived demand influenced by the effectiveness of medical care in producing health, the cost of medical care and the individual's health insurance status etc. Uh, simply put, there would not be a demand for health care or demand for medical care if there was no desire for maintaining good health status or maintaining well-being. So, because there is a desire for well-being, uh, there is a there is an intrinsic desire for well-being, there is an instrumental uh, utility of uh, good health, uh, therefore there is a demand for health care uh, services or medical care services. So, that makes demand for medical services as a form of derived demand. There are of course empirical applications and policy implications of the Grossman's model. Grossman's model not only theorizes about demand for health, but it also provides a framework for empirical analysis follow, allowing researchers to test hypothesis about health behavior and the effects of various factors on health outcomes and various large scale and small scale studies have been carried out uh, in the backdrop of the Grossman's model. Uh, various empirical uh, studies on uh, health production or health consumption uh, on health insurance models has taken after the Grossman's model. Um, as uh, I was pointing out in one of the last classes, very recently Grossman himself had extended his model as well. There are policy implications by framing health as a capital good and detailing how it is produced and maintained. Grossman's work offers significant insights for health policy, particularly in the areas of health insurance, uh, preventive care, public health interventions aimed at improving health capital through lifestyle changes. Often we discuss about uh, health policy designing. Uh, policy designing in the context of lower income groups, higher income groups and so on. We also discuss about designing policy keeping in mind the health outcomes of lower uh, income groups, higher income groups and so on. When we are discussing about health policy, uh, this is the domain in which uh, Grossman's model utility function as well as the production function is often applied uh, 
to uh, come up with a good uh, design of policies uh, for preventive care, for promotional care and so on. So overall Grossman's monograph fundamentally shifted the perspective of health economics by integrating elements of human capital theory into the analysis of health behaviors and healthcare demand and it set the stage for numerous studies and policy discussions in the subsequent decades. What we have done currently as part of the Grossman's model is a very small part of trying to understand the preferences for health and how do we want to uh, depict our preferences for health in the form of simple uh, utility functions and production functions and um, slowly we will see how these models have been applied for various other considerations in the healthcare market. Now, let us uh, uh, pay some more attention to the shape of the demand curve for health. There is a lot of discussion around uh, this. Like uh, various uh, private goods, there are different kinds of private goods, there are different elasticities of demand as far as uh, private goods are concerned. Uh, health care uh, is not a homogeneous uh, uh, unit of good. There are different kinds of health care and depending upon the different kinds of health care, the demand for different kinds of health care also differs. For example, demand for immunization and vaccinations are uh, you would see are universally demanded by uh, uh, people general particularly for parents who have uh, younger children or on the face of infectious diseases and so on. Now when you are faced with a demand for uh, immunizations and vaccinations you would see that generally people are willing to pay um, whatever it takes to keep them secure from a particular infectious disease. But when it comes to uh, prescription drugs or when it comes to uh, elective surgeries, there is often a choice that is being made with regard to the price of uh, carrying out the uh, surgery. Uh, so it is in these uh, circumstances that we need to understand the price sensitivity of the consumers in the context of healthcare market. So much of the policy debate about how best to organize provision of healthcare is grounded in two questions. One is, is the demand curve for healthcare downward sloping or in other words, uh, are people sensitive to the price of healthcare? Secondly, uh, we know that people face are faced with different prices or have different willingness to pay uh, and therefore they get different amounts of care. So do they then end up with different health outcomes? And various studies have shown us that the answers to both of these questions is yes, which means that consumers are price sensitive when it comes to medical care and people with different budget constraints, different life expectancies and different qualities of life usually evaluate the choice that they have to make between medical goods and other goods differently. So which means that there is a trade-off that is experienced with respect to medical goods and other goods. So, for example, one person may decide to skip a knee replacement surgery for her child's education or another person may decide to get a laser eye surgery uh, during a festive season then buying an expensive gift. So, this is a trade-off that takes place and a choice that is to be made by a rational consumer. So, determining the right amount of care cannot always be merely a medical matter. Although we have discussed that there is information asymmetry in the medical care market, in the health care market, patients have to go through the doctors, uh, there are intermediate doctors are intermediaries in the market and because health is valued universally by um, all sections of the population, there is a very high uh, value placed on uh, well-being or demand for health. But it is not always depend the choice of demanding health care or making a choice about the right amount of medical care is not always a medical matter because the outcome is often uh, an economic trade-off. Uh, between the choices because individuals are constantly trying to trade off uh, the balance, the trade off between the marginal cost of care against the marginal benefit of care. And we have plenty of uh, examples, instances such as this in our uh, daily lives. So, uh, the question regarding is demand for healthcare downward sloping as we see in the case of all other common goods and services in uh, the private markets. For estimating a demand curve for healthcare, there are two basic questions that we must pay attention to. How do we define quantity of healthcare? So, what is the uh, Q in healthcare demand function? And second is what is the P or how do we define the price? Um, as I said, we know that in the case of private goods, the determination of quantity and price is fairly straightforward, but healthcare is complicated. For example, if you have a quick visit to the doctor's office uh, for outpatient care, um, and you get some prescription drug, 
uh, compare it with an overnight stay in the hospital where you are getting inpatient services. Both of these services are not the same, but if you consider both of these as one unit of health, then it is of, of course not appropriate. So the quantity demanded of health, uh, also health care, uh, differs based upon the kind of services that we are looking at. So, healthcare demand is not a homogeneous unit, it comprises of a heterogeneous um, bundle of goods and services that we are demanding in the healthcare market. Similarly, pricing of healthcare is also not straightforward because in some cases we know that healthcare is available free of cost. Um, there are countries across the world where there are, where healthcare is heavily subsidized and uh, the it does not uh, lead to catastrophic health expenses. In some countries, healthcare is pretty expensive, um, there, which ends up uh, in very high out-of-pocket expenditures. Uh, in some cases, because of insurance uh, uh, in healthcare, uh, people pay a premium uh, and in some cases there are co-payments that are made out of uh, for availing health insurance. So therefore, the pricing of healthcare is also not as straightforward as in the case of buying let us say a mobile phone. So, these are uh, some of the different types of healthcare which can help us understand uh, how we demand healthcare or uh, how sensitive we are to the price uh, that we are paying for different kinds of services. Uh, we have brought in uh, four different types of services, let us say outpatient care which is the most uh, common form of healthcare that people in all countries seek which does not require a hospital stay. You visit doctors in their offices and then collect prescriptions and based upon which you uh, purchase drugs from the pharmacy. So, the, there are prescription based drugs um, that is which is referred to as outpatient care or outpatient services. Uh, inpatient and emergency room care is the second type of uh, services which requires overnight hospital stays based upon doctor's prescriptions or advice and so on. Um, so, which means that the demand for outpatient care and the demand for inpatient and emergency room care also needs to be modeled or needs to be understood uh, by carrying out uh, experiments. We cannot club outpatient care and inpatient care as the same. Uh, as one homogeneous unit with respect to as far as uh, demand for uh, health care is concerned. Uh, there is also pediatric care uh, which is another important department in most hospitals uh, that we go to which mostly caters to children uh, in the 0 to 6 years and sometimes it also they also cater to young adolescents. And uh, we can safely put all other types which can include mental health, dental care, prescription drugs, elective surgeries for various kinds of uh, um, diseases or disorders that people face and so on. Now, let us look at uh, how sensitive uh, patients are or individuals are in each of these uh, categories. Now, before we can do that, I would like to introduce uh, two experiments that are frequently used, uh, frequently referred to in the uh, domain of uh, health economics. Uh, they are health insurance experiments, uh, which has provided a huge database, which has provided a pool of uh, uh, information on which various kinds of analysis have been carried out with regard to utilization of services. And uh, often the textbooks that we refer to in health economics will make references to these experiments which were largely carried out in the United States. Uh, one of the uh, highly referred to experiments is the RAND Corporation's health insurance experiment. This was a comprehensive study which was conducted by the RAND Corporations in the United States from 1974 to 1982. So, it is a long term experiment uh, that was carried out and also this experiment coincided with the findings of uh, Grossman's model uh, which came out around uh, in the early 1970s. So, some of the uh, um, some of the hypothesis of Grossman's model have also been put to test in the RAND health insurance experiment and which, which sort of contributed um, empirical uh, findings. Uh, to the health economics community immediately following the uh, Grossman's demand for health model. So, the RAND HIE uh, model explored the effects of different levels of health insurance coverage on medical spending, utilization of medical services and health outcomes. And I just said that this study is most cited in health economics textbooks for design and impact on health policy. 
there are a few key aspects of the RAND HIE study which I think we sh uh, every uh, all students who are getting introduced to health economics should be aware about. One is that this is based upon the randomized control trial which is uh, considered the gold standard for clinical and social research. Uh, in this uh, study about 6000 individuals from different socioeconomic backgrounds and geographical areas were randomly assigned to various insurance plan. So, this corporation was set up uh, to provide various kinds of insurance plans uh, which had different uh, co-payments for each insurance plan and uh, different individuals were randomly assigned to different insurance plans and then their health seeking behavior was studied uh, depending upon uh, the insurance plans that they were assigned to. Uh, there was variation in coverage, the insurance plans provided different uh, deferred uh, primarily in the amount of cost sharing required from the participants. So, there were free insurance plans, there were uh, insurance plans which had a co-payment of 25 percent from the patients, 50 percent, 95 percent and so on. So, these kinds of differences in cost sharing as far as the insurance plans were concerned allowed the researchers to examine how the costs were borne by patients and how that influenced their use of health services or their behavior, health, health seeking behavior. Some of the outcomes uh, measured, uh, the study measured a range of outcomes including the use of health services, overall healthcare expenditures and, out, and actual health outcomes of the participants. In this class, we will not be focusing on health outcomes and overall healthcare expenditures, but we will certainly try to see how these experiments uh, gave us uh, broad ideas about uh, how people uh, take decisions about uh, spending on outpatient care services, inpatient care services and so on. Now, the uh, RAND uh, health insurance experiment uh, findings were influential in shaping understanding of health insurance in the US as well as in many other countries across the world. It uh, focused on increased, it, some of the findings were as follows that increased cost sharing generally led to reduced utilization of health services which means as the price of uh, seeking health care increased less utilization of health care services but with the caveat that there was no significant impact on most health outcomes for the average participant. We will uh, leave this part out when we are discussing some of the empirical papers we can discuss this but the focus here uh, should be on this that increased cost sharing generally led to reduced utilization of health services. This is one of the important findings of the RAND study. It was also seen that uh, free or highly subsidized health care increased utilization but did not significantly improve health outcomes for the average participant except for those who were poor or had a high risk of poor health. And this uh, finding is one of the very uh, striking findings from the RAND uh, health insurance study which has gone on to uh, guide uh, policy designing uh, for uh, in many developed as well as the developing countries where universal health care has been planned out for a poorer or a higher risk population. Um, subsidized health care services have been uh, provided to the poorer populations across the world. Uh, the fact that uh, highly subsidized health care did not significantly improve health outcomes for the average participant basically gives us an indication that when there is health insurance, people often um, go for health treatments that can be avoided and uh, therefore this kind of a behavior where people have access to health insurance and uh, you are faced with a problem of moral hazard, uh, you know has led to uh, the finding that probably accessing uh, healthcare services also does not uh, significantly improve health outcomes for the average participant in this experiment. However, in general it has been found that free or highly subsidized healthcare does increase utilization of healthcare services. And finally, that healthcare utilization is highly responsive to changes in the cost sharing percentage and that is what we will discuss now. Now, along with the RAND health insurance experiment, uh, the, uh, another large uh, experiment that has been cited in health economic studies is the Oregon Medicaid experiment. This is also a randomized control trial which was uh, a significant research started in 2008 in the United States for investigating the effects of expanding Medicaid to low income uh, adults. 
Um, the uh, Oregon had limited funds to expand its Medicaid program and chose to allocate access to insurance programs through a lottery system. So, this lottery provided a unique opportunity to conduct a randomized control study as only some of the applicants would receive Medicaid coverage and others would not. So, this was a natural experiment and in this experiment about 90,000 low income adults signed up for the lottery and approximately 30,000 were selected to be given the chance to apply for Medicaid coverage. So, you have again two groups of population in the Medicaid study. You have lottery winners who are likely to be availing Medicaid, the insurance policies and uh, the uh, lottery losers who are not likely to get Medicaid coverage. So, the experiment aimed to measure the effects of having Medicaid coverage versus not having it on several outcomes including healthcare usage, financial strain and health outcomes. And the Oregon study also had very significant findings uh, first with regard to healthcare utilization. It concluded that individuals who received Medicaid were more likely to use healthcare services including primary care and hospital services than those who did not receive Medicaid. With respect to financial impact, Medicaid coverage significantly reduced financial strain. Covered individuals were less likely to have unpaid medical bills sent to collection or to experience catastrophic out-of-pocket medical expenses. Uh, catastrophic out-of-pocket ex medical expenditure is a term which is often used in the context of healthcare economics. This is referred to as the level of uh, expenditure, private expenditure made by individuals or households at the household level which uh, severely impacts their ability uh, to uh, contribute to their well-being, overall well-being. Uh, so, this is something that we will take up in one of the later classes. What is catastrophic out-of-pocket expenses? Uh, does India qualify under the category of catastrophic out-of-pocket expenses or have things changed in the recent years after the declaration of universal health coverage? Health outcomes is another important finding from the Oregon Medicaid study. The study found improvements in mental health conditions such as depression among those covered by Medicaid. Uh, improvements in some physical health uh, like hypertension and diabetes were not statistically significant within the initial two year study period, but uh, there was a significant impact on the mental health status of people who had access to Medicaid, which means that that also gives us an indication that people's productivity uh, increased uh, because of access to the insurance program. Participants with Medicaid reported better access to care and were more likely to have regular doctors compared to those with coverage. So, these are the two experiments that gave us uh, these broad conclusions with regard to healthcare usage. Uh, in other words, demand for healthcare. Much of the empirical facts that we have uh, with regard to health seeking behavior of uh, people in different uh, age groups, people in different income groups uh, is uh, because of these kinds of large scale studies uh, which uh, makes economic analysis in healthcare domain all the more important. So, I want to introduce to uh, this uh, table here. This is a table which I have taken from uh, the Palgrave Macmillan uh, Health Economics by Jay Bhattacharya, Timothy Hyde and Peter Tu. This table here uh, refers to uh, evidences for outpatient care. I have just mentioned that outpatient care refers to patients going to doctor's offices for prescription drugs and so on. So, this table here, uh, this shows the different uh, co-payments uh, by the patients. As I just, this is based upon the RAND, uh, the table A is based upon the RAND health insurance experiment study. This table shows us the average number of annual episodes uh, uh, by condition, meaning acute condition and chronic condition. This basically tells us the number of episodes for which uh, patients have responded to outpatient care for acute cases and chronic cases. I must mention to the learners here that acute cases basically refer to sudden onset of illnesses or illnesses which are of short term nature. Chronic illnesses refer to long term illnesses. For example, if somebody is suffering from hypertension or diabetes, these are referred to as chronic illnesses which is long term illnesses that requires treatment over a longer period of time. And you would see and this is the total of both acute and chronic illnesses. So, these tells us the average number of episodes 
uh, for, for which patients have reported in the hospitals and you would see that the number of episodes comes down as the percentage of co-payment increases from free insurance plan to 95% uh, co-payment plan. Uh, so, the number of episodes reduces from an average of 3 uh, episodes per year to an average of 2 per year. Uh, and this is not just for all uh, episodes of uh, outpatient care reporting, this is true for acute illnesses as well as uh, chronic illnesses. Although the numbers are relatively smaller in the case of chronic illnesses, still if we plot all these figures in the form of a demand curve, we will see that we are faced with a downward sloping demand curve. So, this is uh, one of the experiments uh, which conclusively gave us the idea that uh, demand for healthcare is downward sloping. In table B here, we, uh, we have the Oregon uh, medical experiment. So, here we have uh, two groups, one is lottery winners and uh, the lottery losers and you would see that the percentage visits, uh, so lottery winners are the ones who, uh, who are likely to be included in the uh, Medicaid insurance program and the lottery losers are those who are left out of this program. The percentage visits are higher for the winners and lower for the losers. Similarly, the number of episodes for which they have reported outpatient care services is higher for winners and lower for the losers. This again gives us a conclusion that we are faced with a downward sloping demand curve when it comes to outpatient uh, care services. Uh, so, outpatient care services are certainly price sensitive. Uh, individuals are sensitive to the change in uh, prices, the more they have to pay, the less the demand uh, outpatient care services. Now, the same experiments conducted similar kinds of experiment for inpatient care services and as I have just mentioned, inpatient care refers to uh, care which requires overnight hospital uh, stay. Again, here we have average of annual visits for inpatient care by the uh, patients uh, who have been randomly assigned to different uh, groups. These are the co-payment groups, the insurance uh, co-payment uh, groups. These are the insurance uh, co-payment uh, groups. So, which means you have uh, free uh, plan, You the patient pays 25 percent rest by the insurance company, patient pays 50 percent rest by the insurance company, 95 percent and rest by the insurance company. So, uh, here our intuition is that demand for inpatient care uh, may not be as sensitive to uh, price as outpatient care. But in this case, the results from the large experiments are mostly mixed. The uh, Oregon Medicaid experiment supports our intuition. If you see the percentage visits are not so much less 7.4 percent and 7.2 percent. Uh, although the number of visits are slightly lower for the lottery losers than the lottery winners, but still the Oregon Medicaid experiment uh, supports our intuition that probably for inpatient uh, care um, individuals or patients are not very price sensitive. But if you look at the RAND experiment, members of the 95 percent co-payment group were less likely to have inpatient care than members of the uh, free plan in an average year. And the RAND uh, health insurance experiment also showed that the drop in service use at higher prices was smaller than the corresponding drop for, uh, the, for outpatient care. If you look at the outpatient care uh, figure here, you would see that the drop in inpatient care is much less at the 95 percent level uh, than is for the outpatient care. So, relatively speaking, the RAND experiment also finds that demand for uh, inpatient care is not as sensitive to price as is the outpatient care. Overall, the uh, both outpatient care service, uh, demand for outpatient care services and inpatient care services based upon the RAND uh, health insurance experiment tells us that the demand for these services comes down as the patients uh, have to pay more. But relatively speaking, the, the drop in the case of inpatient care services is relatively lower than in the case of outpatient care. So, this is a clear example of how within healthcare services, within demand for healthcare services, there are different kinds of services that 
um, face different price elasticities. Uh, so, demand for inpatient care services is relatively um, uh, less elastic than that of the outpatient care services. Similarly, there is evidence for emergency care here from the uh, RAND study and uh, the uh, Oregon Medicaid study. In the case of uh, emergency care, RAND and Oregon experiments have given different results. The RAND experiment showed that uh, people in the cost sharing groups uh, were less likely to visit the ER than people in the uh, free plan. But the, um, uh, the Oregon study did not have much of a difference, which means that um, there is not much difference between the two different groups of uh, population seeking insurance for emergency care. Uh, that is also to say that demand for uh, emergency care services based upon the Oregon Medicaid experiments indicates that demand for emergency care is inelastic or less elastic. But the RAND health insurance study uh, tells us that people in the higher co-payment brackets have less probability of emergency uh, care use, which means that they are price sensitive even in the case of emergency care services. There are similar uh, uh, findings coming from uh, uh, preventive pediatric care over three years. Now, one of the things that you must have realized by now is that when we talk about uh, healthcare services, as I mentioned, there are different kinds of healthcare services. And uh, in the case of pediatric services here, the people who are demanding healthcare services are usually the parents of children. So they are the payers of healthcare. And one would like to assume that since parents uh, put a lot of premium on the health of their children, they might not want to compromise on the care and uh, cure that should be received by their children. Now, this was tested in the case of immunizations received by children uh, in the insurance groups and any preventive care that is to be uh, paid for by the parents in the uh, two groups. And as you can see, this is from the RAND health insurance uh, study. As the number of, as the co-payments increase, immunizations decline. Similarly, any preventive care for which parents uh, want to avail insurance also declines. This is not so much in the age group of 7 to 16, where immunization rates are more or less the same in the free uh, group as well as the co-payment group. But in any preventive care, you would see that there is a decline. So yes, there is a premium that parents uh, put on the health of uh, children. Uh, particularly in children uh, in the lower in, uh, age group, in the 0 to 6 age group, where survival rates are low and there is a lot of uh, focus on um, ensuring that the children survive and they get all the basic immunizations. Uh, so, one, what we have seen that the, there is a lot of focus on ensuring that children get the immunization in these years, not so much in the older age groups. But even within the uh, younger age group, we see that there is a decline once uh, individuals have to pay uh, for the immunizations. For preventive care, we see more decline. So this also concludes that uh, in general, we are faced with a downward sloping demand curve as far as preventive pediatric care is concerned. So we have seen this in the case of outpatient care services, inpatient care services, emergency care services, and as well as preventive pediatric care services that generally uh, individuals are faced with a downward sloping demand curve, which means that they are price sensitive uh, and therefore elasticities of demand as far as the different healthcare services are concerned is a matter of cons is, is an important matter when discussing the trade-offs between health goods and other goods in the uh, map of consumers uh, preferences. This is a, a figure that uh, I have again taken from uh, the Palgrave Macmillan Health Economics which uh, which uh, calculates the elasticities of uh, various goods. So the figure here displays uh, the price elasticities of demand for various goods along with the health goods that has been pointed by the 
uh, RAND experiment. So, you have inpatient care services, dental services, outpatient and all care. Now, just a point of caution to the students that mostly when we are looking at price elasticity of demand, we often um, ignore the negative sign because it is calculated on the uh, negatively sloped demand curve. So, we are mostly looking at elasticity ranging between 0 to 1, when it is closer to 1, it is relatively more elastics, elastic, closer to 0, it is less elastic and if it is more than 1, it is highly elastic. So, in this figure here you would uh, see uh, the scale where the elastic demand left hand side here below minus 1, uh, if you ignore the sign 1, it, this one says that this is more elastic, the above minus 1 shows inelastic demand here. So, a price elasticity less than minus 1 indicates that the quantity demanded is highly responsive to price change. For instance, uh, fresh tomatoes have an elasticity of 4.6, uh, suggesting a significant change in quantity demanded if the price changes. Uh, similarly, there is inelastic demand which is in the right side which is closer to 0, a price elasticity greater than uh, minus 1 but less than 0 indicates that the quantity demanded is less responsive to price changes. So, you have salt here for example, which has a value of 0 0.1 uh, which is uh, highly inelastic, uh, coffee has 0 0.25 which is highly uh, inelastic, uh, movies 0 0.9 which is highly inelastic. But if you look at the values here, inpatient care services, dental, outpatient and all care, you would see that they are mostly closer to um, uh, 0, suggesting that these are the goods that are more inelastic compared to let us say a restaurant meal. So, there are two points that I am trying to make here. One is that in general, in general health good, when we demand health goods, in general demand for uh, medical care or health goods, we are uh, faced with downward sloping demand curve, faced with downward sloping demand curve. Second point is that even if we are faced with a downward sloping demand curve, demand for healthcare services, demand for healthcare services or healthcare is relatively inelastic, is relatively inelastic compared to most common goods, compared to most common goods that are traded in the market. So, there are two important points here. One is that in general demand for medical care uh, or health goods we are faced with downward sloping demand curve, which means that consumers are in general sensitive to the price of uh, uh, medical care. And second point is that even though we are sensitive, they are relatively inelastic compared to all other uh, goods and services that are traded in the healthcare market. And uh, therefore, the price elasticities of different kinds of health services being demanded is an important area of study within the field of health economics. And there is a lot of attention uh, given to calculating the health elasticities of demand uh, at the country level, at the state level, at the household level and so on. These elasticities have been uh, calculated based upon the uh, RAND study and reported by the scholars mentioned here. I have uh, taken these uh, uh, tables and figures from the ch uh, chapter 2 of the Palgrave Macmillan Health Economics, which is one of the textbooks which I have uh, suggested as an important reading for the learners who are enrolled in this course. So, before I can conclude this lesson, let me uh, uh, summarize the discussion that we had in today's class. In today's class, we first began with uh, looking at the key points uh, put forward by the Grossman's demand for health model. Uh, we have seen that the Grossman's demand for health model is a very important uh, model which has uh, provided various roles, uh, dual roles particularly to health 
where health is looked at as a consumption good as well as an investment good. Uh, we have uh, discussed about how uh, production of health at the individual level or at the country level has important uh, interconnections with various other variables and uh, uh, therefore empirical analysis based upon Grossman's model helps in policy designing, uh, the health policy designing in both developed countries and the developing countries. In the second part of the lesson, we uh, got introduced to two large scale experiments that have uh, been carried out in the United States. Uh, the health insurance experiments, RAND Corporation's health insurance experiment and the Oregon Medicaid experiment. We have seen that both of these experiments have provided important conclusions in the context of healthcare utilization that when um, access to uh, healthcare is provided or uh, when insurance is provided, demand for healthcare increases and utilization of healthcare services increases, although there are caveats with regard to its impact on health outcomes. And this is something that needs to be looked at cautiously because when we uh, talk about demand for healthcare services, income is a very important variable. Uh, healthcare services demanded by lower income population, by higher income population will have different kinds of health seeking behavior and also impacts on health outcomes. But one of the things that uh, these large scale studies have conclusively come up with is that the impact on lower sections of the population or lower income groups is uh, significant, which means that free insurance programs or health programs that are provided to uh, high risk population or poorer populations have significant impacts on their health outcome. Based upon the uh, findings of the RAND study and the Oregon study, we looked at uh, four uh, services. We looked at outpatient care services, inpatient care services, uh, emergency services and pediatric care services. And we saw that in general in all of these studies, the RAND health insurance experiment uh, uh, showed us that uh, the if we plot the uh, figures uh, that we saw, we experience a negatively sloping demand curve, which means that consumers in general or individuals in general are sensitive to price changes as far as the different kinds of health uh, services are concerned. Uh, the Oregon study provided us mixed results in some cases, but in general we saw that uh, in all of these services, whether e even in the case of emergency services, where the intuition is that probably the focus will be more on care and not on prices, even in emergency care services we saw that there is a downward sloping demand curve that individuals are faced with. Finally, we also looked at the price elasticities that have been calculated for inpatient services, outpatient services, dental services and so on. And we saw that we, we came up with two findings. One is that there is a downward sloping demand curve. But secondly, also that uh, the uh, if we compare health goods will, with all other goods that are traded in the market, uh, the health goods are generally inelastic or relatively uh, inelastic compared to all other goods and services. Uh, however, although they are downward sloping or uh, the demand curve for them is downward sloping meaning that they are price sensitive. So, this gives a sufficient justification to conclude that demand for healthcare is downward sloping. Evidence shows that people take into account price when deciding how much medical care to seek even when their conditions are serious. Um, I have not brought into this discussion the issue of mortality, uh, but mortality is also importantly uh, discussed in the context of RAND and Oregon. Uh, uh, health insurance experiments. Uh, interested learners may want to look up the uh, conclusions that these studies have uh, drawn with regard to uh, mortality uh, in the population. In healthcare markets, consumers are faced with downward sloping demand curve. However, emergency care may be less sensitive to price, not entirely. Economic trade-offs matter even in the world of health, which makes economic analysis of healthcare relevant. Uh, downward sloping demand implies a fundamental trade off for design of any healthcare system. Uh, it, uh, healthcare system, like many other uh, systems in free market economies, requires uh, an economic analysis. And various empirical and experimental studies show that consumers are price sensitive for almost all types of healthcare, uh, irrespective of emergency care or elective uh, surgeries, and so on and so forth. 
For this lesson, I have heavily depended on the textbook Palgrave Macmillan Health Economics. This is uh, uh, strongly recommended to the learners of health economics. This gives us a very comprehensive introduction to uh, healthcare and concerns um, that is applicable to both developed and developing countries. Although this uh, textbook takes uh, the US economy as the backdrop to discuss most of the health policies and the programs, however, for a learner in developing economies also, uh, this is a book that will provide uh, much information. I have also uh, you, uh, depended on some materials from rand.org which gives us a, a sneak peek into the various experiments that they have carried out uh, for since a very long period of time and uh, this is again a, a huge resource that can be utilized by the learners. The Poverty Action Lab uh, provides various resources on healthcare economics. I have uh, referred to their evaluation of the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment in United Studies. There are many informative papers that can be found in this uh, website as well. If you are uh, interested to go deeper into the analysis of demand for healthcare, I would strongly suggest you visit this website as well. So, in this uh, lesson, we have discussed a few more points about demand for healthcare. I think with these two lessons on demand for healthcare, um, uh, a learner who is getting introduced to this course on economics of health and education will have a fairly good idea about where to place demand for health when we are looking at trading of goods and services in the healthcare market. In the next class, we will discuss about supply of health and uh, uh, so see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.